Okay, I think we can we can start. In any case, uh, people can can join in um, as we go. So um, welcome all to the fifth episode in a series of webinars showcasing the use uh, cases and benefits of Copernicus, the Earth observation component of the EU space program. My name is Sofia Oterugomono. I'm part of the Copernicus board office and I'll be your moderator today. This fifth webinar looks at how Copernicus data can be used for the monitoring of marine and equestrian environments. For instance, uh, Earth observation data can be used to monitor temperature changes as well as understanding their effects on these environments, which is crucial uh, for the protection from global warming and other hazards. I should mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Copernicus EU YouTube channel. To make the webinar a bit more interactive, uh, we will be using Slido for live questions. So if you have downloaded WebEx, you will find Slido on the right hand side of your screen in the app staff. If you're joining us directly from your browser, you can access Slido using the link shared in the chat. Uh, you may respond to the questions that pop up on Slido as we go. Uh, and also you may ask your own questions based on the content presented today. So please feel free to type in your questions so that we may answer them during the Q&A sessions after each one of the presentations. So just to, to start off as an initial icebreaker, uh, we would like to ask you what sector do you currently work or study in? Uh, the, the question is up there in, in Slido. So um, whilst I give you uh, some time to, to reply, uh, I will give you a brief uh, overview of the agenda for today. So we will start with an introduction from Fabienne Jacques from the European Commission. This will be followed by three presentations from experts in the field. Christine Stelzer from Brockman Consult, uh, Christos uh, Stefanakos from Sintef Ocean and Giovanni Di Piero from Gino. Uh, following each of these presentations, there will be opportunities for questions, as I mentioned before. Uh, so please feel free to, to type in your questions on Slido. Now, before uh, we give the floor to Fabienne, I have another question for you, which is, how would you rate uh, your knowledge about Copernicus on a scale from one to five? So now, as you um, reply, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Fabienne Jacques. Fabienne graduated as an engineer in solid state physics in 1988. Since the start of her career, she has worked in the space sector, first as systems architect and then specializing in interfaces with users for the development of Earth observation missions. In 1999, she joined the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security Program and later on the Copernicus Program, where she was responsible for following the development of the Copernicus services, firstly within the emergency service and then the Marine Environment Service. Uh, she was Deputy Director of the Space Oceanograph Oceanography Division and the Director of Data Collection Division in CLS, a subsidiary of the French Space Agency. In 2016, uh, she joined UMEDSAT uh, to keep working on the future of Copernicus on the public side in the Strategy Division. And currently, as Policy Officer at the European Commission, she brings her expertise to the Copernicus unit, being in charge of the Marine Service, the evolution of the services at midterm, and the monitoring of Sentinel Ocean missions, such as Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-6. Fabienne, the floor is yours. Uh, good, af uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, given the, the topic of the, the session today, I will present you uh, very briefly uh, the Copernicus Marine Service in a few words. So, you know that um, the ocean is really at stake at the time being and given and is taking a big momentum in terms of in, in political area and environmental area with uh, uh, the, the, the COP that we had in 2019 on the ocean and cryosphere, the One Ocean Summit that was uh, an added state uh, summit uh, conference of parties that was held at the beginning of this year in France, the UN conference, that uh, UN Ocean Conference as well that was done and, and many activities and many many policies that are developing in Europe around the ocean. So the ocean is really high in the agenda. Um, in fact, in Copernicus and in GMS at the very beginning and, and in Copernicus since 2014, we operate what we call the Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service, CMEMS, um, which uh, uh, is dealing with really with ocean monitoring. So what is CMEMS? CMEMS is, fact, is, a, is a, a, a group of ocean forecasting and monitoring center 
to make real-time monitoring and forecasting uh, for a few days uh, up to uh, and in the past as well uh, of the ocean state and the ocean health. Um, what is the ocean state? How we characterize the ocean state and the ocean health? In fact, the ocean is uh, monitored along three uh, type of variables, what we call the blue ocean, which is about the physical content and the physical behavior of the ocean, meaning currents, temperature, waves, sea level, and so on. What we have then, we have also monitoring the white ocean, which is about sea ice, ice coverage, velocity, concentration, icebergs, and so on, in the Arctic and a bit in the Antarctica. And then we monitor as well what we call the green ocean, uh, giving information on the biochemical content of uh, the ocean, namely uh, its content in CO2, in nutrients, in oxygen, in primary production, in chlorophyll and different types of plankton. Um, how it works? Uh, in fact, we take uh we collect information uh observed observation coming from space with specialized satellites like sentinel 3 sentinel 6 but as well sentinel 1 and 2. Uh, we collect as well in situ data coming from member states contribution mainly and we uh, assimilate this kind of data into ocean numerical models that represent the behavior of the ocean along the three components blue white and green and from this, we deliver what we call ocean forecast for different variables. Um, and, uh, and we also uh, monitor the evolution of the ocean behavior in the past uh, through long-term series and climate records. Uh, which kind of information can you find in the Copernicus Marine Service? So you have a website, which is marine.copernicus.eu. In this website, in fact, you have a full catalog of 174 products where you will have the description of the ocean in real time, every day, and forecast for the different types of variables that I, I, I gave to you. You can I find as well in this, um, in this website what we call ocean monitoring indicators, which are in fact the, the regular monitoring of ocean state and ocean health like eutrophication, acidification, sea level rise, and so on, in terms of trends, which are refreshed every month. And then annually, we, pub we publish what we call the Ocean State Report, which is a, a, a big document written by scientists across the world, which is peer reviewed, so it's very serious uh, contribution, and that describes uh, uh, what is the current situation uh, all over the oceans in terms of health in terms of changes in terms of behavior will it be uh, i don't know fish uh, fish stock in the med sea or sea ice melting in the arctic or in the antarctica or um, any kinds of information like this what is it for in fact uh, cmems is delivering information for different sectors of activities uh, it supports policy making and policy implementation at member states level and it is support as well international commitments on climate, on oceans, and so on. What are the different sectors of activities where it's valuable to have this kind of information? It can be, for example, for water quality monitoring, safe, uh, support to maritime safety, uh, management of natural resources and energy, uh, fisheries or marine food, fisheries and, and aquaculture. It's also used for coastal monitoring, like coastal erosion and coastal floods. It's as well uh, supports all what is about really environmental monitoring, which that can be polar environment monitoring, but as well marine conservation. And, um, and this is as well used by quite a lot of scientists uh, for climate monitoring. And from this data, in fact, then uh, it enables uh, many users so at the timing we have around 50,000 users connected regularly to the CMMC service uh, capturing data every day to make their own business so it can be used for different kinds of applications like uh, calculating the marine time efficiency of some vessels in terms of fuel consumption uh, for shipping companies it can be used for pollution monitoring like the sargassum or oil spill or um, uh, pollution of uh, macroplastics. It's used as well for uh, by citizen app. Eh? For will it be for uh, uh, 
uh, wave forecast for surfers or uh, for citizen science uh, on plastic uh, monitoring and drift. Um, this is heavily used by the energy sector that wants to develop renewable energies based on wind or tides or waves. Um, it's also used in conjunction with people uh, from the civil security dealing with floods for all what is flood prevention in coastal area and for fisheries or aquaculture siting, uh, which can be interesting. So this is really a short overview of the marine service and you may have other examples this afternoon on the, of this use. So I give you the floor, that's it for me. Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Fabian, for this uh, thorough introduction. Uh, I think we we can invite our our first um, speaker now. But before um, we do so, I would like to ask you another question to you, the audience, which is what brought you to to this webinar on Copernicus for monitoring the marine and lacustrine environments. So. As you reply to our question, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Christine Stelzer. Uh, Christine is a geographer specialized on Earth observation of water and coastal zones. Uh, she joined Brockman Consult in 2000 and is leading the Department for Geoinformation Services. Uh, besides algorithm development and validation, she's developing user products based on satellite data, which are tailored to fulfill uh, users' needs. Christine, the, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. So we will first jump from the marine service to the inland waters. Um, and in fact, um, it's not a Copernicus service, but it's Copernicus data um, we have used here, um, what I would like to show you to you. So it's about um, the usage uh, the usage of the Copernicus satellite data for the monitoring of the quality of inland water bodies and um, the detection of special events. Uh, first, a short, very short introduction. What is water color? So, what can the satellite see? Um, in fact, we see a lot of different water colors, but why do we see them? Um, it's because there's something in the water that has a color or that is producing a color because of scattering and absorption processes. So there's sunlight and this is changed within the water by these substances. And this is the full process that we then measure at the sensor in order to detect what is in the water. Um, so it's absorption and scattering processes on, on algae, on plankton, on on, on sediments or on dissolved organic, organic matter. So those three main compon components um, determine what color is our water. And this is the basis of everything we, we can do with optical remote sensing for, for water quality assessment. So as said this, um, we will turn our eyes to to some events and some data. So what you see here is a Sentinel-2 image in RGB. It's from August 2022. You see here a river um, and some smaller water patches. And what we do is then going into the water or um, getting information about the water what what is in there. And one of the parameters, which is very important, is the chlorophyll concentration, which is a proxy parameter for um, algae concentration. Um, <clears throat> then um, if we have, so we can calculate this for each um, single image. As I said, this is a Sentinel-2 image. We have used here a resolution of 20 meters and um, get the water information. And we can also, um, I would like to change screen now. I'm, I'm now moved to a viewer where we, where we see um, similar things. So um, to see how this looks in space and in time. So once we have one image processed, it's useful to see what, what happens um, over time because water is changing so fast. Um, and um, you see here um, the city of Hamburg. This is the Elbe River flowing through the city, some harbor areas, some bigger lakes. 
And um, if I remove the RGB, we look into the water again. Now we have the parameter turbidity, which is another parameter which is very important. So it's about how turbid the water is. Um, you see that the, the Elbe River is quite turbid while the inland water seas or lakes are rather clear. I will change to another parameter back to the chlorophyll concentration which we just had. So it's more about algae. And what we see here is um, there's a lot of algae in, in the eastern part of the Elbe River flowing through Hamburg and coming towards the North Sea and it's, it's much less algae than included in, in the water. And, and this is just one spot, but it's also, of course, interesting to look into time series. And I have put here two points and we'll show a time series for, for this point. This is the chlorophyll concentration in this lake, which is a bathing water lake. So people swim there, they dive. Um, it's quite a clear lake. And we see a quite good um, seasonality. So this is from 2018 until 2022. And um, we see some spring blooms, um, but um, over the year, the, uh, the lake is quite clear. And this is opposite to, to the Elbe River, which has a high chlorophyll concentration. And if we look into, into the time series for the Elbe River, we see that it's, it's a completely different seasonal trend that is shown here. Um, the spring bloom is later and we have, we have also summer blooms. So this just to, to show you that, that we have to look into different dimensions if we, if we want to understand the ecologic status of, of a water body. And we can do this very well if, when we put all the data we have um, together, for instance, in, in, in a kind of a data cube as we did it here and then put it in a viewer to really have a fast access to the data. Um, going back to the presentation, um, this is about the viewer just shown. I would like to come to one um, concrete example um, which happened in summer this year in, in the Oder River. Um, I think a few of you might, might heard, have heard about it. It was quite a big topic in, in at least German news. Um, so there was a big fish kill during the summer months and um, there was a lot of investigations going on to find the reason why, why this this fish was killed. And it, it was the, um, so in the beginning they said there must be some poisoning, poisons. And so we thought, okay, we cannot see anything with optical remote sensing because usually poison is not visible in, in color. But then it turned out it is in toxic algae bloom. And um, so we thought, okay, algae bloom, we can, we can do something with optical remote sensing. And in fact, it was a, an algae bloom of a brackish um, algae. So it's usually not growing in, in rivers, but in brackish water. And, um, but the conditions this summer were so, so extreme um, that we had low water level and we had um, yeah, salty water coming from, um, from industry, which is normal, but um, because we had such um, low water level, it was too high concentrated. So this algae could grow and it grows that, that massive that um, the fish um, was was killed. And then there were questions, where does it start? And, and so a lot of research and then we, we looked into satellite data in order to help these, um, these questions to be answered. And um, yeah, just that it, there were a lot of news in the newspaper. Um, and so we, we did this, um, as I showed you before, we, we can detect the chlorophyll concentration as a proxy for algae blooms. And, and these are different concentrations and you see um, there are points each um, 200 meters and they represent a certain chlorophyll concentration and the more yellow the point is, the higher the chlorophyll concentration and the blue and the dark blue, the, the lower the chlorophyll concentration. This is a period in end of July. And, and here it starts that yet 
you see higher concentrations in the south in the older river. So this is the river. And um, then um, a good week after this, we, we see a really massive bloom um, further north, um, which you see here. And again, a few days later, it has been jump, um, flown towards um, um, down, downstream. And, and it's also a bit diluted and a bit wider. And this is going then towards the Baltic Sea. And, and then it, it decreases a bit and mid of July and end of July, uh, end of August, sorry, it, it is almost normal again. So if we, if we go, sorry. My presentation just jumped away and decided not to be on the screen anymore. Um, sorry for this. Back. So, if you if you go faster through this, um, yeah, these periods for the algae bloom, you see how it is moving towards the Baltic Sea, and then um, end of August, it's more or less done. But this this massive bloom, this um, was was one of the reasons why the fish and all the ecosystem was in such a exceptional situation. Um, besides the special events, um, of course, the satellite data can provide also um, regular monitoring of the quality of water. And um, there are a number of near real-time services um, for inland waters, also from Copernicus, there are um, products for global um, lakes. Um, and yeah, there are downstream services um, to to users that that use this information for assessing the the water quality of the lakes in combination with the in situ data. So each incoming satellite product is processed, and the statistics are generated. And and either we can provide alerts if there is an exceptional high chlorophyll concentration, or if there is occurrence of cyanobacteria blooms, which is also toxic and um, dangerous to go bathing if uh, if such blooms occur in, in high concentrations and, and if they develop toxins. And yeah, in general, um, we can provide then the overview on water parameters over, over longer periods, as I've shown in, in the viewer, that we can look into the time series. And what we, what we do for users is that we generate such um, fact sheets for, for certain water bodies. So this is one lake and we see a time series of chlorophyll concentration and um, different ways how to look into the data and to show how is the situation for the cyanobacteria over the months, over the years. Was it a good remote sensing here? Was it, was it a bad one with few data? So this tells us a lot about the availability of the data we have. And um, also compared to in situ data we, we, we get from the users and we integrate into these plots. And then we can go through different lakes to, to compare them um, between each other. And um, yeah, so this is, this, this was a bit spotlights to to um, things we can do with the satellite data and how to organize them and how to present them to users so that they are useful for their daily work. And um, so the key messages I, I wanted to, to give with this is that um, to say that satellite data are, are used for the assessment of ecological parameters for inland water and coastal waters that satellite data provide a complementary information to in situ measurements in space and in time. So we have different dimensions and so all, all is useful and the combination of it is, is even more useful. And, and suitable interfaces and tools are essential to support users to work with the data to not processing and downloading each, each single data set by their own, but, but really to, to use tools that provide all this for the users. And yeah, thank you for your attention. 
this is what I wanted to tell you about the inland water. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for this really interesting presentation. Uh, we now open the floor to the, to the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, you can post your questions on Slido. You can also share them on the chat. Or if you want to talk directly, uh, you can raise your hand. Um, whilst we, we let um, everyone think about the questions that they want to ask and share them. Um, I, I I actually had a, a few. <laughs> um, since I'm not um, an expert on this, I was wondering, uh, because you mentioned um, that one of the parameters that you can check is the turbidity, and you showed it in the case of Hamburg um, with the Elbe River. And I was wondering what kind of information do you, do you gather from that? Um, you mean what it is used for? Yes, for instance, in the case of chlorophyll, you mentioned that the, the concentration is related to the concentration of mm -hmm. algae. In, in the case of turbidity, what, what can you extract from that? Um, it's important for the ecosystem because it determines how much light can be in the water and on the ground of the water, for instance. Um, so about the ecosystem, how, how well algae can grow if it's really, really turbid, then there's not enough light for algae to, to do photosynthetics, um, uh, for instance. And it's an indicator for sediment transport, which is also important um, for dredging and, and things like this. So that that if there's too much sediment coming with the rivers, um, that, that there's a, yeah, sedimentological questions and morphological questions behind. Um, of course, we, we just see the, the upper layer of the water. We don't see what is on ground, especially not if it's very turbid. Um, so it's, it's always an indicator for something and then to be interpreted with the knowledge about the system and perhaps models. That's always very useful then. Very good to know. Um, again, the, the floor is open for anyone uh, with questions, um, and maybe following up on this uh, on this question that I, that I just asked you, um, if if you explained that I didn't catch it, but you you showed uh, this data from a uh, lake and also from the river Elbe, and you showed how in the lake uh, the levels of chlorophyll were, were higher than in the river. Uh, what's the why is it that in some regions of the river the the levels of chlorophyll were higher and why in comparison to the, the lake there was this difference? Um, so there's no connection between the river and the lake. So they are disjuncted uh, ecosystems. And um, the river yeah, gets all this nutrients from, from upstream. And um, then west of Hamburg, there's much lower concentrations because there the, uh, the water is much more turbid coming from the North Sea. And so there, there are interactions between the different substances. And yeah, and the lake is quite a clear, clear lake. So it, it was an artificial lake. Um, and it's, yeah, there's not much nutrients in it. So no, not much algae can grow there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, oh, okay. We have uh, one question from the audience, which is, is the spatial resolution of Sentinel-2 sufficient or do you experience difficulties due to spatial resolution? Uh, yeah, of course, it, it depends on the size of the water and there are limits to, to the lower side. Um, two small water bodies cannot be detected well with the resolution. Um, yeah, this is the the main thing, but and and we like to to average a bit. So sixty meter Sentinel two is is better in terms of um, noise because we average and we aggregate. Um, so the signal to noise ratio is a bit better. Um, but in these cases, we use twenty meters, but this introduced a bit more noise to to the data. Then. And of course, if you need higher resolution, then you, you have to change the sensor. <laughs> and in relation to this question, we, we have another uh, question from the audience, which is what are the uncertainties on these uh, derived parameters? 
Um, so for the turbidity, when we compare it to in situ data, it's um, it's quite okay. I don't I can't give you a number. Um, chlorophyll has a higher uncertainty also because in situ measurements are a bit more difficult and um, you can do things differently and so you we get different um, data for comparison. Um, yeah, and the the algae themselves, they have quite different optical properties, um, but we have to assume a certain optical property of, of an algae because we cannot simulate everything. Um, so there are differences between if there's a different algae type, it can have a different relationship between the optical signal and the concentration. So this is why the chlorophyll concentration is has a higher uncertainty than the turbidity or sediment transport. Thank you. Thank you once again for your interesting presentation and for answering all, all the questions from from our audience. Um, we now then move on to our next speaker. Uh, Christos, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. So our next speak speaker is Christos Stefanakos. Christos is a senior research scientist and he's working with Sintef Ocean in the Marine Modeling and Analysis Group. Uh, he has a PhD in ocean engineering. He has over 25 years of experience in stochastic modeling and anal analysis of multivariate data of metocean parameters. He's author and co-author of of 54 peer reviewed papers, two books, and 14 abstract reviewed presentations. Uh, he has participated in several European research proje projects related with the creation of metocean atlases, including atlases on wave energy, hydrodynamics, hydroacoustics, uh, wind, and waves, as well as the stochastic modeling for the analysis of metocean data. Christos, the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for the opportunity you, you gave me. Uh, before starting the presentation uh, per se, I would like uh, to give a very, very brief introduction of the company I'm, I'm working uh, uh, with, uh, which is called uh, Sintef Ocean. Uh, so Sintef uh, is one of the uh, largest, uh, Europe's largest independent research organization with uh, uh, 2,000 employees from 75 nationalities and uh, is an uh, independent non-profit uh, uh, research uh, organization and the structure is uh, like that. Uh, so it covers all the aspects, uh, all the technological aspects uh, from energy, manufacturing, uh, digital world, uh, of course, ocean. Uh, and also the implications with the society, which is uh, covered by Sintef community. And uh, so, especially for Sintef Ocean, uh, we are working with any kind of uh, technological application uh, or research uh, uh, connected to the marine environment uh, from uh, renewable energy, aquaculture, uh, oil and gas, uh, 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 shipping, uh, uh, underwater mining, uh, uh, new biomarine resources like uh, algae uh, and so on, marine pollution, uh, fisheries and so on. So all these applications, of course, uh, they need either in the first stages or uh, in, in any later stage, uh, some or a lot of information uh, about the marine environment where uh, the structure or, or uh, any other uh, thing that is going to happen, uh, uh, happen in the specific environment. Uh, that is why we need uh, either directly the, the clients or uh, colleagues from other departments of the company, they asked, uh, our group, which is called the Marine Modeling and Analysis, uh, to answer them various questions concerning uh, the marine environment where we live, uh, it will live, let's say, for example, the, the structure or something else. Um, 
so I'm going to present you uh, some uh, very few, uh, I have to admit, because of the limitation of time of the products of uh, Copernicus that we are using. Uh, either uh, some of them we are using directly uh, when the client has um, needs just a rough idea about uh, uh, the environment, the area. Um, we are using directly the the, the original uh, data of Copernicus. Uh, but if the the customer needs a more uh, detailed uh, analysis of the specific environment, then we use the same data as boundary conditions uh, to more regional or coastal uh, depending uh, models, either hydrodynamic or biological or, or uh, uh, wave models. Um, so we're using uh, boundary conditions from Copernicus and then we generate a, a more uh, uh, accurate results uh, using uh, higher uh, resolution models. So the first case is about the product uh, you see here, uh, uh, containing uh, biological parameters. It's a global product and covers uh, a very long, almost uh, 30 years. <clears throat> and uh, we used as boundary condition for this area with the red uh, rectangle uh, is in the South uh, uh, Frozen Ocean uh, between uh, Patagonia and Antarctica. And the, um, the target was uh, to run uh, first uh, in the re red uh, rectangle uh, with uh, five kilometer resolution, uh, our hydrodynamic slash biological modeling, and then uh, to two nested uh, uh, smaller rectangles with resolution 800 meters in order to, to, to uh, study um, the spatiotemporal distribution uh, of krill, for example. This is an example. Um, and here is um, just an animation uh, of the results. Just, I'm going a bit quick see the other cases also uh, um, here we have uh, uh, let's say the sister product of the previous uh, so again covers uh, almost 30 years and uh, has the physical parameters uh, current uh, temperature salinity etc and um, in this case we are using directly the uh, the Copernicus data um, just uh, to show uh, to to give a rough idea to the customer uh, about the the creation uh, of uh, sustainable conditions uh, for some kind of uh, uh, marine facilities that, that I cannot say more about this project, but uh, I think this is enough about the use of Copernicus. And uh, the third one um, is very interesting project. And it's more scientific of scientific nature rather than of uh, uh, commercial use. But uh, in my opinion, it's, it's very important also. Uh, so this product contains uh, wave information wind wave information uh, and covers again 30 years and uh, right now there are uh, another two uh, products from other uh, big meteorological organizations uh, in the air uh, with similar duration uh, so it's very good that we will uh, we would have some kind of comparison between the other two uh, the other two is era 5 from the other leg of uh, Copernicus uh, uh, ECMWF and uh, wave, wave, wave uh, uh, from uh, era five. Now we have more than uh, 50 years, I think, but in this study we have used from uh, uh, 79, I think, so it's 40 years. And uh, WaveWatch, we have 30 years again. WaveWatch uh, has been generated by NOAA 
and uh, the laboratory, I don't remember the name exactly. Um, and of course, the uh, CMEMS uh, product, which is, uh, you, you can see here. Uh, the comparison between the two first has already been published and presented in conferences. Uh, so the results are, are already uh, available. So the comparison of all three now would be of interest also to see the performance of these global models because you know that all there are a lot of interest uh, interested uh, uh, both scientists and customers uh, in such kind of products. Um, now again back. Uh, uh, to the uh, physical product uh, containing the, the velocity, the current velocity, temperature, etc. Uh, I mentioned before. Uh, this time, this will be used uh, for the study, which is also the subject of this uh, seminar. The study of, of a semi-enclosed uh, basing known as lagoon. Uh, technically speaking, and uh, this is uh, situated in the uh, central uh, west part, west, yeah, west uh, central part of uh, Greece. Um, I can, I, I found, I, I couldn't find them yesterday, but I, I found them today, some pictures, just to have an idea. Uh, so, so, this is the entrance. Let's no. Let's start from the previous. Uh, so let's let's start from this one. Uh, so uh, the study of this lagoon uh, has a lot of peculiarities. First, the the one there is another lagoon before that, uh, neighboring the the sea, the open sea. And this lagoon is very, very shallow, uh, whereas the inner lagoon is much deeper. So you can see uh, there is a, a cross section uh, here, for example. So you can see that the inner lagoon can be a bit less than 30 meters, whereas the outer lagoon is only, I don't know, uh, uh, about five meters. This is one peculiarity. And the other one, as an introduction, uh, and the other one is uh, in the entrance of the inner lagoon, there is this island uh, where is the city of Etolikon. Uh, and uh, this island is connected with uh, the two uh, shores with some kind of bridges. But these bridges, have very, very uh, uh, shallow openings. And uh, if we see somewhere here, if we see these openings can be only eight centimeters and only in a few, uh, uh, let's say areas, they, they have a, a depth of uh, two and a half meters. And here is a 90 centimeters. So all these peculiarities make uh, the exchange of water uh, uh, very difficult. Uh, and uh, the result is that uh, the anoxic uh, the level uh, the anoxic level of, of the inner lagoon, while in the past was uh, uh, very low, now it has become uh, uh, higher and higher. And um, this in combination, of course, uh, with the fact that uh, in this uh, lagoon, all the irrigation channels uh, uh, just uh, uh, leave uh, uh, the water full of uh, uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers, of course. So, uh, to contribute, not to solve, but to contribute this problem, uh, uh, we need it uh, as um, in a um, uh, project, an AR project. Um, um, 
uh, we're trying to to uh, make the modeling of this lagoon, the hydrodynamic and biological modeling of this lagoon, and then compare with measurements. The measurement campaign is underway, so we don't have the comparison yet. We we hope next year. But the point concerning the uh, Copernicus is that <clears throat> um, we use the nested model starting from the open ocean, the Atlantic, and then the Mediterranean, and finally uh, the I Ionian Sea, uh, then uh, the uh, Gulf of Patras, this is area just outside the lagoon, and finally the two lagoons uh, here. So this is the, uh, uh, the way of nesting. And, and uh, we for the two uh, last uh, steps of the nesting, then we use as uh, input uh, uh, as um, sorry as uh, boundary conditions a uh, data uh, from the product I, I mentioned before uh, from uh, Copernicus uh, from CMEMS uh, database. Uh, just before I close the presentation just to show you some results from uh, this domain. This is chlorophyll, and here is uh, current speed, uh, the monthly uh, mean uh, of the surface layer, and uh, okay, and here is for the inner lagoon, the Atelco lagoon, Again, chlorophyll and uh, the current speed. So, this is for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christos, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Again, we open the floor to everyone uh, to ask any questions that they may have. Um, my, uh, my first question, maybe to break a bit the, the ice is, uh, what's, what do you think it's the, it's the greatest challenge that you face, uh, when in, in all these, uh, very different, uh, projects, is there any, anything in particular? Um. Uh, look, uh, depending the the case and the, the problem now, because there is a myriad of problems uh, in the ocean that uh, some others, they, they are asking for waves, some other are asking for wind, uh, for temperature, whatever. Uh, so, so uh, I think the first thing is to know, not everything, but to know uh, uh, as good as you you can, or as to read, uh, <laughs> be informed I, about the quality of the of the existing uh, models. Uh, so, uh, if you ask me about uh, wave modeling, I know that one model is the best model right now. <laughs> For example. <laughs> And then starts, you know, uh, the gossip around the experts. <laughs> mm, but uh, which implementation of one, uh, the one of CMWF or the, the other one of uh, Meteo France? And um, mm, there is a third one uh, covering uh, this part, uh, having these uh, uh, peculiarities. So these things only by. Uh, uh, speaking with people and uh, exchanging information, <laughs> you are learning something. Uh, there is no other way. I mean, there is no newspaper for that. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, you know. In fact, you mentioned that one of the of the projects was actually comparing different uh, different uh, measurements and different models. So, I guess yeah. that's also important to I, then be able to decide which one to use. I I think yeah, or or at least. To say something like uh, where the models, both models or all models, um, show or have the tendency towards the same direction. So, concerning, let's say, the study of extreme values, maybe they diverge. 
but uh, for the study of the main body of the probability structure, maybe all they give the same, more or less the same picture, for example. Uh, so yes, uh, this and this is good, I think, for the community to have such kind of, of publications. And uh, because also the first study between the uh, era five and uh, wave of three, uh, has a third um, uh, source of data, uh, altimeter data, uh, which is a kind of independent from the other two sources, sort of. But there is a literature about that, but you know, now don't, don't make everything very complex. So compare both of them towards a third source, then you had a kind of um, third independent uh, uh, pole of the discussion, let's say. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so the conclusion, I think, is that knowledge is power <laughs> and that you need to be up to date to to know how to yes. carry I, your I research. Think <laughs> there is no other way, I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> no, no. Magic solution. <laughs> that, that's a, that, I think that's a good conclusion. Um, I, if you don't mind, we'll move on to the next uh, presentation as we're a bit pressed uh, on time. We thank you once again for this very interesting presentation. And so now we go uh, to our third speaker today, uh, Giovanni. Uh, our ne next speaker is uh, Giovanni Di Perro. Giovanni is the CTO and co-founder of uh, Fisialytics. Uh, Giovanni is a specialist in design and development of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms for different purposes. Uh, Giovanni, all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizer for this opportunity. Uh, so, Fisialytics is a, a web and mobile software application for the management of uh, aquaculture offshore facilities. Uh, it, is, it is designed essentially to uh, uh, to face different problems that the sector of uh, marine aquaculture is facing in the, in the recent years, mostly related to the operational complexities, uncertainties, uncertainties and exogenous factors. For, for example, the adverse weather condition that might affect and compromise the, the quality of the of the fish harvest and also the physical integrity of the of the of the cages on the aquaculture plants. Uh, secondly, uh, the impact of the operational activities and the maintenance activities activities on the economic performance of the aquaculture plants, which is mostly affect uh, this factor. And thirdly, um, uh, the lack of knowledge of the correlation between the, uh, the data that can be retrieved from the aquaculture plants to the impact of the, uh, of the environmental impact of the aquaculture plants. So since there is no uh, any kind of instrument that allowed any kind of tool that allowed the fish farmers to, to face this kind of problem, fish it was essentially designed to support uh, fish farmers to um, to make better decision about the management of the of the plant in, itself, so the main idea uh, behind uh, this uh, this project is essentially to aggregate and analyze uh, different data coming from different sources. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, the main uh, the main data that are collected from the from the service from the from the app is essentially weather forecast uh, uh, retrieved by CMAMS. For, for, so my satellite earth observation and in situ sensors mounted uh, uh, on the plants on the, on the uh, on the aquaculture plant this is very useful because it allows to uh, carry out it allows the, the fish farmers to uh, prevent uh, damage for example to the cages for example the image can, uh, can uh, happen if the wave height is uh, larger than a, a predefined threshold for example. Then secondly, uh, Fisheritics allow to retrieve data uh, related to the management and the operation uh, performed on the, on the aquaculture plants and uh, uh, by, uh, by means of different modules of uh, data entry. And then thirdly, uh, Fisheritics take into account also the biological conversion between uh, the, the, the feeding that is given to the fish and the biomass the, and the, the conversion of the biomass they take into account for example the chemical composition and the chronometry of the feeding so all, all these data are integrated in, in, uh, in our own um, in one platform and uh, uh, it allows as i said uh, fish farmers to uh, better make a decision 
about the operational activities of the plant and maintenance activities of the plant. And the division of uh, officiality is essentially related to, uh, uh, to, to use, to unlock the potential of data, to use uh, the, the power of artificial intelligence and data analysis to extract uh, uh, feature and patterns from satellite observation and operational data in order to, uh, to provide uh, fish farmers with a tool that uh, that um, reduce the economic, the, uh, that reduce uh, the environmental impact of the of the aquaculture facilities. So how facilities works? First of all, as I said, we have three different kind of data sources. We have CMEMS data, uh, which are related to the uh, biogeochemistry, for example, the physical uh, and the, the waves of the uh, of the aquaculture plants. And then we have operation data, which is, uh, which are retrieved by different modules of data entry uh, that can be related, for example, to the to the maintenance status of the cages, uh, to, the, to the feeding schedule, and so on. And then we have uh, IoT sensor data, which are mostly used to calibrate uh, CMEMS data and exploit the uh, forecasting services provided by CMEMS to uh, improve uh, our model. Uh, the backend officiality is essentially uh, uh, devoted to combine all, all this data and to use artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to extract uh, features from data and to provide fish farmers with the uh, fish growth model. So to ad hoc fish growth model that can be used to predict the status, the health status and the growth status of the, of the fish in the next days. So uh, fish ethics also uh, allow to predict, um, uh, for example, uh, events of uh, where the waves, uh, where the eight waves is larger than a particular threshold. So, in order to allow the fish farmers to uh, to make the operation, in order to prevent, for example, the, the breakage of the nets, and so on. All these data are shown on a on a dashboard, uh, which is optimized for both for desktop and for mobile. Since, uh, of course, operator in aquaculture plants uh, typically use uh, mobile uh, mobile device, of course, to uh, to um, to register the operations. So uh, CMAMPS is extremely useful for officiality because, as I said, they allow us to retrieve from three different products of CMAMPS, uh, talking about the sea, Mediterranean Sea, Biogeochemistry, Sea Waves, and Sea Physics Analysis and Forecast. We can get uh, hour by hour, day by day information about, for example, the, uh, the content of nutrients of the water of the aquaculture plants, for example, the phytoplankton, the dissolved inorganic carbon, and dissolved uh, molecular oxygen. Also, we get information about the waves, so the, the age, the period, and the direction of the waves, which is extremely useful for an aquaculture plants to prevent the breakage of the net. And then the, the physics, uh, uh, such for example, the temperature, uh, the salinity, and the, and the currents. Uh, then, um, uh, the data entry allow to acquire different data, the fit quantities, the, the uh, data related to the maintenance, to mortality, and so on, to the sampling, also to the first uh, harvesting data in order to uh, create a, a data set that can be used. It is essentially a time series data set that can be analyzed using multivariate time series forecasting and regression modeling with the artificial intelligence. Uh, the main thing is the main output is a, a set of fish growth model, which is optimized on the aquaculture plants under consideration it is optimized of course on the species that we are uh, that we are studying uh, uh, so far fish analytics is working essentially with sea bream and sea bass but we are planning to extend of course this application also for different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of species and most importantly is uh, by analyzing data with artificial intelligence it is possible to extract a uh, feature importance ranking so to understand which which feature are the uh, the most important are, the, are, the, are those that uh, affect most the fish growth models. And thanks to this, uh, to this work, we have selected uh, IoT in situ sensors for the, the solid oxygen temperature and the wave properties in order to calibrate the uh, CMEMS data, uh, so the historical CMEMS data. By comparing the historical CMEMS data and uh, the IoT in situ sensor measurement, we can calibrate the CMEMS data and then use exploit the uh, forecasting services provided by CMEMS in order to better improve, uh, uh, in order to improve the model prediction. 
Um, in this slide, I've shown three different uh, screenshots of the, of the platform. We can see a uh, different set of plots where we can see, for example, the blue line, the historical uh, information about, for example, here, the wave height, and the, and the red line is uh, the prediction of uh, in, the, in the next future. This is very, very useful for uh, fish, far fish farming because it allows to, uh, to, to gain a, a comprehensive overview of the status of the, of the water and uh, a prediction of the, uh, of course, of the same, of the status of the water in the next future. So in this slide uh, is shown the, uh, the, the part of the application uh, devoted to uh, support uh, the fish farmers to uh, decide the, the feed quantities and the, the feed typology to give to each, to each cages in the plant. Uh, for example, here on the left is shown the plot of the time evolution of the feed quantity that is already given to the uh, to the cages, and this uh, and it, it is superimposed the time see the time evolution of the temperature or the water temperature temperature, which is very very uh, useful for fish farmers to decide about the feed the feed quantity to give to the to the cage, and then on the right we have the the prediction using uh, our models of the of the growing uh, average uh, weight of the of the fishes inside uh, a particular cages by taking into account the status of the of the water and taking into account of course the operation of the, the feed the, the feed schedule. Uh, of course, the area the shaded area indicates essentially the uh, the spread of the of what we expect for the average weight uh, since we we are taking into account a range of the conversion of factor conversion between the the feed quantity that is given to, to, to the to the cage and the the, the, the conversion to the, to the biomass because of course not all the, the the amount of the feed is converted to the biomass but in this case it's possible both to monitor and to predict uh, what it uh, what the average will be in the next future um, in this slide i've shown the uh, the, the achievement of uh, fish analytics, we started as a, a, as a with an hackathon, a couple course hackathon organized in Italy in 2020. And we uh, joined also, the, we participate also in another hackathon, the Washington. And we then in 2021, we were accelerated by the Copernicus Accelerator, which was extremely useful for, uh, uh, to, to improve the model, to improve the, uh, the model prediction using CMEMS data. And then in 2022, we were selected among the best startups in uh, in, uh, in aquaculture at Oceanology International. Thanks so thanks to, 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 for the attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for this very interesting presentation. And as you showed in your slide, it's very it's very nice and to see mainly for us at the Copernica Support Office that. Uh, a project that started in a Copernicus hackathon has now managed to evolve. Uh, so to have you here again, it's, it makes us very happy. Um, so once again, we open the floor to everyone for, for the audience to ask any questions that they may have. Um, you mentioned that uh, currently you're focusing on two, if I understood correctly, two species of fish, and you want to expand it to others. Um, is it is this because each species is affected differently by the parameters that you monitor, or why is it that it's focused on on these two, and that you have to make changes to adapt? Yes, because for example, the repetability, so the, the behavior that uh, the fish have when uh, they are feeded are different among the different species, and this is mostly related to how they uh, are affected by the water temperature, for example. And so the the, the model that we are uh, that we are working with. Are optimized for the for the fish rate species because we we see we understand from the data that uh, each species behave differently, uh, um, and so for example the, uh, the 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 nutrient content the dissolved oxygen is very very important for the appetability of the fishes, uh, depending on the species. So uh, each model is optimized for of course for the aquaculture plants and for the species. I I don't see any any questions, but if anyone has one, they they're more than welcome to ask them. Um, otherwise, I think that since we're a bit over time, uh, we can we can wrap up and thank you again for for your presentation. And You're welcome. Uh, thanks. 
so we are reaching the end of this fifth Copernicus webinar. I want to thank uh, again our speakers uh, for such interesting and engaging presentations and thank you to the audience uh, for your participation. Uh, we hope that you learned something uh, new today about how Copernicus can be used for monitoring water bodies. And if you have any other questions or comments, uh, you can reach us through our online channels, which I will be sharing with you right now. You should see them on the screen, hopefully. And before you leave also, we would like to ask you um, what's, um, we would like to get your feedback on uh, how useful uh, this uh, webinar has been for you. So that's if WebEx allows me to ask you this question, of course. There we go. Uh, yes, so again, before you leave, please, uh, we would love to know how useful you have found the, the content of this webinar. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinar. Uh, have a nice day and see you next time. Bye. Bye.